Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead on AM 530 at 1.30 p.m. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and I'm the Communications Director for the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform. Now, recently on our radio show, we aired a presentation that I gave at the University of Ottawa called Porn Fuels Rape Culture. And in that presentation, I talked about how uh, porn addiction is becoming pandemic in our culture and how the type of pornography people are choosing to consume, which is increasingly very violent pornography, is fueling a culture in which rape is becoming trivialized and in which sexual assault is being consumed as entertainment. And my fellow presenter, Daniel Gilman presented right after me, and his topic was entitled, How Porn Fuels uh, Sex Trafficking. And the interview that we have for you today covers both of those topics. I'm quite excited to present this interview with you with a very, very brave and courageous woman named Shelley Lubin. Now, she used to be a porn star back in the 90s and ended up leaving the industry and beginning something called the Pink Cross Foundation, which can be found at www.thepinkcross.com. Dot org. Now, Shelley Lubin entered the adult film industry while working as a prostitute, and, and her story is really in many ways a very depressing, a very revealing. She has a lot to say about what happens inside the industry, uh, what happens on the other side of the computer screen, if you will, and really gets into the details of what actually happens inside the pornography industry and what all of us are cooperating with and even funding by looking at pornography as a culture. So I hope that you'll really listen to her story closely and take the things that she has to tell us to heart. So the first question I just wanted to ask you is, is you've uh, recently founded an organization called uh, the Pink Cross Foundation. Could you just tell our listeners a bit about the Pink Cross Foundation and, and your work uh, with that foundation? Well, we started Pink Cross uh, Foundation in 2007 and became a 501 c 3 in 2008. And what we do is we literally rescue and assist women and men out of porn, as well as we also will reach out to uh, strippers and sex workers. But we largely focus on the porn industry because there's not a lot of people reaching out to them, that people group. And the reason I reached out to those people is because I was one of them. Um, I was involved in the porn industry back in the 90s, and I was also a trafficking victim in porn. A lot of people don't understand that women in porn are being sex trafficked. And so um, I got out of the porn, and then I recovered for like 8 to 10 years, and I didn't, never wanted to talk about porn ever again, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but um, God just had a call in my life to go back to those people and reach out to them, and also to um, educate people about what they're really contributing to every time they click on porn. Right, and I, I was recently giving a presentation with one of my friends at the University of Ottawa, and on his topic was making the case that porn does fuel sex trafficking, and you say that uh, you yourself were trafficked into porn. How did that go about? Because I really do feel like it's something that most people who look at porn aren't aware of. Well, a lot of people think that pornography fuels sex trafficking, and it does, but it, it does that because it is sex trafficking. And um, so I made the world's first um, porn trafficking pamphlet that I know of, and I basically tell people that any person who's um, been forced into porn through force or fraud, false promises, threats, coerced, that person is being trafficked. All of the porn stars, it's called a cutthroat business because it's trafficking. All of us have been coerced into doing the scene you want to do. Um, we went to fraudulent doctors or fraudulent clinics they sent us to. Um, in fact, their clinic, the, porn, the main porn star clinic closed down a couple years ago because uh, a lot of us were um, staring against it. But they had a former porn actress who has a PhD in sexology, and she would put on a white lab coat and tell the girls, call me Dr. Sharon Mitchell. So all these girls think that she's a medical doctor, um, and they would go there for her medical advice and for STDs and treatment and testing. And, and I keep telling these girls, I go, no, she is not a medical doctor. So that's just one way they're fraudulent. Another way is, of course, pornographers make false promises. You know, if you do the scene, I promise you're going to get this money or you're going to get the box cover or, you know, or you'll just you won't have to do this kind of scene anymore. It's all based on lies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you got you got to be tough to be in that business. And, and I'm like, why does anybody have to be in a war zone to work in the workplace? This is a California workplace. People shouldn't be calling a workplace a cutthroat business unless it really is. And, and so, you know, and most of these films are, are made in private locations and private mansions or hotel rooms where there's no government access. So it's like two young girls, 18, 19, 20-year-old girls, 
on a, on a mostly older male set. The producer's male, the crew is male, so we have the male porn stars, and, and so of course we're intimidated into doing scenes we don't, we don't want to do. I can't tell you how many times I showed up and they said, you need to do this scene. I said, no, I, that's not what my agent said, or that's not what... You know, I was told to do it, like, well, you're going to do it, or we're not going to pay you, we're going to sue you. And, and now, with the internet, they tell the girls, if you don't do this team, we're going to send your porn to your family members. We're going to ruin you reputationally. You're never going to work again. We're going to take away your finances. We're going to physically hurt you, or they threaten to sue them. This is sex trafficking. Every porn star has been trafficked, at least at one time or another, in the porn industry. Mm -hmm. So when you say that by clicking on porn, you're supporting sex trafficking, really like, uh, like highlight that link for, for our listeners so that those who are listening uh, who may look at porn or struggle at porn can really get a sense of what they're supporting by clicking on porn. What they're supporting is, we know that most of the porn stars have had an STD at one time or another, and they estimate between 66 to 99% have herpes. They don't test for herpes. So, so all these people are involved with rampant STDs, even the L.A. Uh, Public Health Department shows um, they've been monitoring, and, and they came up with thousands and thousands of chlamydia and gonorrhea. They're the highest group um, in California um, to even have that many STDs. So when people click, they're, they're contributing to sex trafficking. They're contributing to STDs. They're contributing to people who are mostly alcoholics or drug addicts. Um, the majority, and I'm speaking majority, and not every porn star is a drug addict, but the majority of them are. Um, and, and I can't tell you, when I went through cover, I had PTSD, I had all kinds of disorders, tra like serious traumas. But when someone clicks on porn, they are contributing to mentally ill, um, diseased, trafficked people every time they click on that porn movie. Right, so uh, you started getting into porn after working as a prostitute, is that correct? Yes. I worked as a prostitute, you know, it's a vicious circle, it's a sex worker really, because I've been stripping, taxi dancing, and you just get burned out, and, and you know, in prostitution, we, you know, we had we to use condoms in porn, they would, there's no condoms allowed. And so we were forced to do unprotected sex, um, and I can't tell you how many people alter their tests. Um, and just last year, they had four HIV cases in five months out of a very small group of people. So, so yeah, I mean, after prostitution, I got burned out, and I was lied to that I would be kept safe from STDs, and I would make all this money, and I was a single parent, and so what the heck, you know, it was my well, it's just sex on camera. But it was completely and utterly the worst, darkest thing I'd ever been involved in. So tell us a little bit about why you ended up, uh, up where you ended up. Uh, when you were a child, what sort of things like happened to trigger your involvement with prostitution and then the porn industry? Well, I was sexually abused at nine years old by a teenage boy and his sister, so I experienced a very shocking heterosexual and homosexual activity at a very young age. Then at the same time, I was raised by the television. I was allowed to watch radar movies, um, horror movies, movies with sexual content. So I learned about love and sex from abuse and from basically parental neglect, that they would just allow us to watch these things. And then um, as I got older, I was rebelling because my dad wasn't very involved in my life. And I began to look for sex from boys, and the boys would tell me they would love me. So this cycle that I built in my head that I'm loved if I have sex with the person. And then um, and my dad kicked me out of the street for being rebellious, and I ended up in uh, San Fernando Valley, which is Porn Valley. And a pimp lured me in. Um, I was very naive. He was always rebellious. I was not even. He lured me in for thirty-five dollars, and then he, um, you know, I had to escape from him physically because he became very abusive. And then I'm, I'm, a madam found me, and it just it spiraled on. And then um, I would hate prostitution and feel guilty. Then I would just stripping to survive. I had no education. Most of these girls bent porn do not really have an education. There's going to be maybe a few who say they have degrees, although I have yet to see one. But um, but most of the girls um, don't don't come from, like, healthy families where they have a healthy self-esteem. And, you know, I know gorgeous women, and I ask them, why, you, why didn't you do porn? They're like, why would I want to do that to myself? Like, they love themselves because they were raised in really healthy families. I, I haven't really met a porn star as a really healthy family. Um, that doesn't mean they're, they don't exist, or maybe they exist in their mind because, of course, the girls in porn want to say they're empowered by their sex work because, you know, what you can't beat, you're going to join. You don't want people to think you're weak when you're in porn. You want to act like you love it, and you love rough sex, and you love being violated and called the great names. But it's all just a pack 
are wise. People do porn because they need the money. Most of them don't have other options or education. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed through my own research and presentations that I've been giving, and there's been a lot of research done on this topic by, by scholars such as Gail Deans, is that uh, pornography is becoming increasingly violent. And, and while pornography was always a devastating business, that while well, one major porn producer uh, said in an interview recently that the future of American porn uh, is violence. Do you think that's an accurate statement? Absolutely. It was, it was even violent back in my day, but um, I, 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 I got involved in probably hardcore porn just because um, I was still with rage from my parents, and we all have our different reasons, you know, but um, I had to prove the world to be the best. A lot of the girls are like that because no one else thinks they're great. But, um, yeah, when I in my day, no, I would have never let anyone rip my mouth or put some weird gadget in my mouth or, like, do something where they're causing a rectum prolapse. I wouldn't have done that. You know, I would have watched what mm -hmm. nowadays, that, that nowadays the girls have to end up doing that stuff um, or because that's what sells. So it's really sad. It's a lot of our society that, but you know, everyone's so desensitized to vanilla sex now and they, they want it harder and, and grosser and darker. And, um, you know, if, I can't imagine what, what it will, our society will be like in 20 years from now. I can't, I, I don't think I I have to like, move to the mountains or something because I, I doubt any woman will be able to walk the street <laughs> at that point. Do you think that the violence that people are consuming in pornography is affecting their everyday behavior when you look at the statistics of just how pervasive porn use has become? Oh, absolutely. I mean, more and more you're, you're hearing about really bizarre cases in the news. Like, I like to look at the news 10 years ago and compare it to now. It's completely different. Like, I look on Google News every morning and it's like, uh, you know, 10-year-old boy rapes three-year-old sister after he watches porn on his Xbox. Um, two porn stars are arrested because they were making snuff films where they're having sex with a person while they're also torturing an animal. I mean, these are, you wouldn't even have heard anything like that in, you know, when I was in it 20 years ago. So you, you see it, you see child porn, firefighters, child porn, teachers, the porn stars and, and or teachers or, or principals that have, get busted for child porn. Child porn is so pervasive. I see it almost every day in the news. Just crazy, bizarre things you wouldn't have heard in the news. I can't imagine what will it be in 20 years from now. Well, you talk to a lot of the girls in the porn industry just as part of your work with the Pink Cross Foundation. What sort of things are you hearing from them about, about porn today that differentiates it to a degree from the porn that, that you were involved in in the 90s? They are just traumatized. It's almost, it's almost even it's hard to even help them because their trust issue is just they don't trust anybody. And so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm mostly helping ravenous, injured wolves. You know, you get too close, they will bite you. And you have to be very careful because they have been extremely traumatized. In my day, I only did like about 30 movies in about 18 months. But in their day, they're doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scenes. And, and they're given Vicodin and Norcos and Prozac to get through. There's alcohol and drugs on this bed. And that, that was in my day, too. But it's even worse now. It can, you know, I didn't use prescription pills back in the day because they weren't so easily, uh, they weren't, wasn't easy to access them. Now the pornographers give them to them. There's doctors in the uh, in the valley that give them. All they got to do is have a cold or, I'm, or I hurt, but they're really trying to get to the scene. Um, the girls, the things they tell me they did, and I, and I go look, you know, up their, their history sometimes so I can kind of understand what they've been through. It's just like, I can't even believe some of the things I've seen, the abuse they've taken, um, how they're forced to vomit. There's nothing sexy about a woman bombing a man. You know, all this gross, gross stuff um, that they, they're doing, you know, it's just, I feel so bad for them. And um, it's, almost, it's almost impossible for them to even find a job after doing that stuff. But, you know, I tell the girls, if you, if, even girls who I, you know, like youth girls or college girls, I go, don't, don't do something that's going to be on the Internet forever because it's going to be on the Internet forever and your family's going to see it. And nowadays, you know, the families are just like, oh, my gosh. Now, like, why is my daughter having her face flushed down the toilet? And, um, and that's just, and we're supposed to smile and act like we love that. So, yes, um, I haven't, I've only met maybe one or two porn stars that, that maybe just stuck with, like, girl, girl. But most of them um, were lured in for girl, girl scenes or easy boy, girl scenes. And then right away, they're, like, get their gangbang with 25 guys, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um when you describe some of the things that have gone on on porn sets and, and my own research when I was, was taking a look at the connections between uh, pornography and rape culture and pornography and, and sex trafficking, the evidence that shows that pornography is connected to sex trafficking and that rape happens regularly on porn sets and that there's a huge amount oh, yeah. of coercion involved, 
but this this information is so readily available on the internet and through academic studies and through testimonies such as yours. So why is there this sort of cultural cognitive dissonance between talking about how we need to, you know, empower women and at the same time we're permitting this, you know, pervasive cultural plague of pornography that completely defies everything else we're saying about women and women's rights? Yeah, it's it's an oxymoron, but I, I really believe after doing this for ten years, I started out in two thousand four sharing my story, but after doing this for ten years, I guess I'm looking at all the people groups. Like my my heart is definitely for the youth as well. Um, so when I spoke to the youth, I said anybody who has own porn just come up to me. You know, I'm transparent, and so a lot of people came up and said, I really want help. I'm, I'm 15, I'm addicted to porn, I'm like, well, can we talk to your parents? And they're like, hell no. My parents are viewing porn, too. So the parents are viewing porn. Mm -hmm. The kids are viewing porn. I mean, pastors, teachers, Christian men, like 75% of Christian men, I believe the last statistic I heard are viewing porn, I think it's poor. But um, it's like, how can we deal with porn if everybody wants their porn, you know? So it's almost... It's almost impossible. Only sincere people are really going to get the help they need. You know, but most people, they're like, well, I'm not, I'm not giving up my porn. You know, and um, it's really, it's just really sad to see. It's almost like, I just feel like, I feel like that superhero in The Incredibles where he's like, I just cleaned this place up and now it's messy again. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like, feel like here I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on, you know, working through like Gail Vines and other people. We're all given our best, you know, sweat and blood and tears to, to help people understand what's going on. And it's just like, you know, I just see more and more uh, people affected by pornography. I've never even seen a plague like this on mankind. And I studied some of the plagues, see like the bond plague and polio. I've never seen a plague like this that affects so many different people across cultures. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. If you're, you know, mostly there's a lot of males, but more and more females are viewing porn. And I'm just like, and I think to the women, how can you view porn? And yet believe in women's rights. That's like, you know, how can you be against your own kind? And yet a lot of them say, well, my boyfriend asked me to do porn now. We're into it. Or my husband and I just fight our marriage to do porn. I said, how are you going to get this marital advice from drug addicts who are diseased and mentally ill? It's, that's stupid. So um, I think I think the key to really helping more people is to keep getting the word out more and more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And that's um, something we really try and do. And also I, I put up like shocking videos of behind the scenes footage of girls being trafficked. Um, people just go, wow, oh my gosh. And, and I'm in a battle because pornographers keep trying to take it down or, or they give me death threats or threaten me or try and ruin my reputation. So it's just a constant war for those of us on the front lines. How did you get out of the porn business? Well, actually, I um, I prayed. I prayed out to God. Those whole eight years I was in the Texas chair, I cried out to God. And um, a pastor's son came into my life, and he just said God called him to marry me, and he was supposed to rescue me, and we got married, and um, we went, you know, I had to go through a pretty harsh recovery for eight years, and um, now we've been married 19 years, so um, that's, how, that's how, you know, God heard my prayers, and he sent me help, and so I know what that feels like to receive that help, so that's why we offer it to the girls, and, and I understand what they're going to, they can tell me anything, and they won't be judged. Mm-hmm. And um, I think we need more people reaching out to these people. This, this small group of people, about 2,000 workers, um, about 75% are women. This small group of people is literally infecting and affecting the entire earth. If we would just all reach out into that industry and also fight the industry as well. I mean, I fight in court too. I can love them and I can stand up against the industry. But if we all were just to go that direction, you know, the industry would just deteriorate to nothing. And, and actually, it is starting to deteriorate as far as the actual industry. With all the free porn and then the fact that all these new laws have come in place, we really went after the safety and health laws. And so, you know, there are more and more. There's not any money for anybody. There's too much competition, too many companies. And so um, it's, it's really going to more. There's just so much free porn out there. And, and then people now are making their own porn in their own house. And So the industry itself is dying, but I see pornography is still pervasive. And it's just getting worse and worse, and people are demanding more violent um, porn, which puts demands on the girls. Right. And when you reach out, when you speak on this issue, and when you talk about this with different people, what is the argument you find that's most effective at convincing them that pornography really is this, this very, very evil threat to our society in general? Well, the best proof I have, because at first the porn industry called me a liar and said I was a washed cooker or something, 
So the best group I have is that we have about 30 ex-porn stars who are speaking out together as one large voice, and also I put up um, actual footage, you know, because I'm like, they cannot, people can say, well, women choose to do porn. I go, based on an uninformed decision. We can show them to say that you're going to go to porn and you have a high risk of catching an STD and um, you're going to be forced to do things you may not totally agree with and, you know, you're going to... Uh, he has to perform it on protecting cell. I mean, all this stuff. I would have been like, okay, well, that's that's an informed decision. Mm-hmm. These girls have no idea. They see the glamour, they see the makeup and the hair, they hear songs sung about being a porn star. It's such a great, admirable thing to be. And these young girls come in, they don't realize, bam, right there. Um, they're going to go to like some ugly motel and there's going to be six guys there and they're like, whoa, 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 you know. And then they're raped. I mean, and that's, that's, a lot, that's the story of a lot of the um, girls that we help is that they had, none of them had any idea what they were getting into. Mm-hmm. No, who, who in the porn industry is going to educate them? So we educate them. We go into actual porn industry and I give them pamphlets and I tell them they're right. And uh, I tell them sex trafficking. I tell them they're not independent contractors. They are employees. They're being forced and directed to do things. And I bring like all the IRS pamphlets. And we try our best to really empower them so they can make a more a, a better decision about if they're going to stay in that industry mm-hmm. or be part of the industry. When the porn stars come out of the business, because you said there's about 30 ex-porn stars um, of stories that you shared, and I've read quite a few of them on your site, um, what really brings them out? Do they reach out to you or do you have to reach out to them? Well, at first we did a lot of like porn convention and nightclubs. I mean, I'm talking like every Tuesday night I would go out and sing with them and hang hang with them. And then we were doing porn conventions like every month to two months, and it just it just went it just went like a snowball. And all of a sudden, um, well, these girls wanted out. It's like a mass exodus. So more and more, we don't have to actually go in the conventions. They come to me now. They know exactly who the ex porn stars are. If you say the word ex porn star, they're going to think of one of us, probably or Pink Cross. And so they're coming to us now. So you know, I I'm, I can't even help all of them until you know it's so hard. It's, it's just like. All these women want out. They want a better life, and and not a lot of people want to want to give to help a porn star. They think, no, she chose that. It's glamorous, and you know, but it's not true. She she did that because she was thinking it was a safe California workplace where she could have the sex that she wanted to have, or that she could make her own choices instead of being controlled. And it's just not that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you talk to you know you know uh, just you know regular people, and they ask you, what can we do to help fight the porn threat? Besides you know, remaining porn free ourselves and encouraging our friends to also be porn free. What is the what is the major thing you think that that can really help people at large? Well, it depends on your sp- your sphere of influence, but I say if you can get your church or organization and you can have someone present, I, I have powerpoints for free up on my website that they can use. Um, they can go to my website and get all these statistics and put together their own PowerPoint. I have I've totally empowered both my personal site and can cross site with tons of resources. All they need to do is take them and pass them out or do presentations. And another thing they can do, um, go go to your um, city council or, and and uh, you know go wherever you live. Just go there and and, and um, you, can, you can go to court. They allow public comment and give a public comment about how you feel about pornography in your community or whatever you want. Um, porn is only legal to produce in California and uh, New Hampshire, of all places. Mm-hmm. So the other 48 states is called pandering. So if, if you know porn is being made, say, like in Las Vegas or Florida, you can go to your city council and, re- and report them or, or call the health department. You know, I just started calling the health department. I called Cal OSHA, which is, um, it has jurisdiction over the workplace. Call your OSHA. You know, go type in OSHA Arizona and see what comes up and then to make a complaint that, you know, that I know for a fact they're filming porn in like Scottsdale, Arizona and Las Vegas now and even Florida. That's, it's illegal to do it there. That's what, you know, it's so hard to walk in and just say, I want, you know, you get your two to three minutes to make public comment. But, you know, how many times I've gone to LA and asked churches to come out and support me and they don't. Mm-hmm. Like, the church. Yeah, I'm like, you know what, we can talk about it all day, but we actually need to also fight against this industry. And you can also love the people at the same time you're standing up, you know, there's already laws on the books. There's obscenity laws. I mean, we have all, you know, most pornography is obscenity. So it's, it's been trained, you know, transport over state lines. That's illegal. I mean, there's plenty of ways to attack the industry. And then, you know, there's other ways they can um, do something. Like if you go in your grocery store and you see, you know, like, 
corn or anything like that, you know, make a statement. I've done it. I went to Albertsons and said, uh uh-uh. uh. And they took the uh, magazine off the racks. And, and uh, one girl, she, she got, um, I think she got like porn taken off an airline or something. You know, people are doing their part. Some people put up billboards if their church can afford to buy one. You know, whatever your little part is, whether it's small or big, it's going to be significant in anything mm-hmm. you do. But I say the best thing I've done is to educate people. Right. Show them the realities of the porn industry. So based on... Basically, basically we, we ruin appetites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Based on your own experience and all those people that you're, you're talking with right now inside the porn industry and all the work that you do, uh, what's the one final message you, you would like our, our listeners to hear? Well, that every time they click on porn, they are contributing to sexual transmitted disease um, among the workers and in the, the L.A. area. And wherever they're filming, they're also con- you know, they're contributing to prostitution because a lot of these girls, they'll do porn, and then when they get too old, you know, they have to do escorting. Well, they also do escorting just because it's easier than doing eight hours of porn. Um, they're contributing to sex trafficking. And from a Christian standpoint, you know, the Bible makes it really clear that do not unite yourself with a prostitute. You can only be united with one person at one time to be in one flesh. You're either united with Christ or you're, or you're, you're united with a prostitute. And if you're, you're you're united with the prostitute, you you're not with Christ, and that's a that's a pretty serious statement. Like Saint Paul talks about in First Corinthians six. So I tell Christians, you just united yourself with the prostitute and all her stuff, all her demonization, all her junk, and it gets on them. It's really bizarre when I talk to people addicted to porn. They have the same symptoms that we did when I was recovering from porn. The same PTSD, the same depression, the same guilt and shame. So I'm like, you see, you, you became one with that person. You're having sex with your computer with that person, and you are taking on their stuff. So not only are you contributing to their demise, you're contributing to your demise, and your family's demise, and your wife. I can't tell you many people have lost their families and jobs. You know? It's really sad. And they're contributing to ch- children being raped, you know? I'm like, for, for, if there's any reason not to click on porn, it's child porn. Just think right now as I'm talking, there are little children that are being drugged and raped right now as we're talking for child porn. Mm-hmm. How can anyone click on porn knowing that? Well, Shelly, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Shelly Lubin of the Pink Cross Foundation describing her story of being trafficked, uh, of being a call girl, of, of working inside the porn industry, and what she works to do now, which is to bring people out of the pornography industry and to try expose the pornography industry for what it is, which is the facilitator for STDs, for rape, for sex trafficking, and how we, as a country and as a culture that consumes pornography on a mass scale, are essentially in endorsing these types of activities by choosing to engage in this type of activity. I really hope that all of you will think long and hard about the story that Shelley Lubin has presented to us. And uh, next week, I have another interview coming out uh, with an expert in pornography and one who also seeks to expose what's going on deep inside the pornography industry. So if any of you are interested in the other interviews that we've been airing uh, that also deal with different topics regarding human rights and the equal dignity and humanity for all, uh, go to unmaskingchoice.ca and check out the Bridgehead Radio on our blog. Once again, thanks so much for listening, and we hope you all have a great weekend.